What's poppin' mutos? It's me, MT, and welcome back to the Heavy Spoiler Show. This is gonna be a breakdown of episode 3 of Monarch Legacy of Monsters that features another sighting of the King of Monsters himself and ending with the reveal of the chillest monster that we've ever seen. And boy, do I mean chill. So strap into your seats, gang, because we're about to get into it. And the episode starts with the camera eye of Monarch watching over a recently rogue Leland Shaw, who, at the end of the last episode, cut off the tracking bracelet that Monarch had placed on him while they had him in solitary confinement. A solitary confinement that Tim's boss, Natalia Verdugo, later refers to as a generous retirement. So I am super curious as to what exactly landed this former military man into Monarch's secret slammer for sneaky seniors. But anyways, after the gang steals a car from the facility and starts to make their escape, I found it kind of hilarious how the driver's side rearview mirror somehow manages to survive the chaos of them ramming into everything, only to randomly and inexplicably break off screen between these two shots while they were just driving without any obstacles. Like what the hell even happened there? We do later see that driver's side mirror fixed with black tape while the gang plan their next move on that boat ride to Pohang, South Korea. But anyways, as the gang finally breaks out of the facility and hits the road, you can see the same mountain from the Futaba resting home brochure in the background. Then after a super dope transition that fades Kurt Russell's face with his son Wyatt Russell's face, we catch up with a young Lee Shaw, a young Bill Randa, and the soon-to-be-covered-in-kaiju-bugs Keiko Mura in 1954, a full two years after they all encountered that winged saliva monster amongst the wreckage of the USS Lawton at the end of Episode 2. Keiko and Bill Randa are introduced to General Puckett, played by Christopher Heyerdahl, who I absolutely loved as Captain Locke in Peacemaker. Fantastic actor. But anyways, they then all head over to a giant footprint of Godzilla that Bill and Keiko discovered in Indonesia. Indonesia. We actually do see a picture that Bill took of Keiko discovering this footprint super briefly on May's computer in the last episode, along with a picture of the nuclear warhead that the general would end up using to lure and explode Godzilla at Bikini Atoll later on in the episode. With Bikini Atoll, of course, being the location that the American military famously conducted nuclear tests at, a place that is now unfortunately abandoned due to the vast amounts of radiation that still linger in the region. But speaking of that nuclear nuclear warhead, when we first see it in the episode, there's a soldier painting the same anti-Godzilla symbol that the people of Tokyo would end up using in the future, which is kind of weird considering that none of these soldiers here had ever seen Godzilla before. So I'm not exactly sure how they got such an accurate depiction of this creature, though I can definitely see these soldiers having somewhat of an idea of what Godzilla could look like based on reports from people across the world who have seen Godzilla pop up before. And when the general asks how Godzilla could possibly walk around the planet without being seen, Bill Randa brings up the possibility of teleportation, something that Lee Shaw dissuades him against doing later on because of how ludicrous it sounds. But I honestly don't think that Bill Randa is off here, especially after we got that flashback of Hiroshi Randa mysteriously teleporting to Kate's location suspiciously quickly as soon as Kate told him where she was over the phone, making me feel like this hypothesis of teleportation might just be a piece of foreshadowing for a possible scientific discovery that Hiroshi Randov might have made about the teleportation migration patterns of Godzilla, possibly even using that discovery of teleportation to visit both of his families in America and Japan quickly and easily, allowing him to have that double life. Introducing the concept of teleportation to the Godzilla universe would actually make sense as it would serve as an explanation as to how Godzilla is able to get to different areas of the world as quickly as they do. There might just be a hidden subterranean network of portals that monsters monsters use to travel the world, likely the same hidden subterranean network of gravity tunnels leading to the hollow earth in the center of the earth that we learn about in Godzilla vs Kong. So Monarch Legacy of Monsters might actually end up being an extension of the hollow earth scientific narrative, with those coordinates that Lee and May look over on the plane possibly leading to different portals across the planet. But that's just my weird theory. I could definitely see that secret being one that Kate and Kentaro's father, Hiroshi Randa, would want to keep from an organization of monster hunters like Monarch, especially considering how distraught Hiroshi's mother Keiko was at the American military's use of a nuclear bomb on Godzilla. I feel like Hiroshi probably wanted to protect all the monster life connected to that subterranean network of wormholes while simultaneously keeping the secret of teleportation away from the sketchy, power-abusing organization Monarch has become. Basically, Hiroshi's way of protecting his mother's legacy and honoring her wishes, but only time will tell. Moving on, 
as the gang are traveling on their boat to Pohang, South Korea, we can see Mei on the phone with an unknown friend, telling them that she might be coming back soon. The way that she talks to this person on the phone makes me feel like she might have a complicated but close history with that person, possibly implying that this person might have been someone Mei could have known intimately in the past. But for all we know, it could also just be a platonic hacker friend or even a family member. But my money is on somebody that will make Kentaro jealous later on. But anyways, when they get to customs in Pohang, South Korea and start standing in the wrong line, notice how Kate and Kentaro are framed here, with each of them separated on different sides of this clock reading 12.30 p.m. Kate on the left side in front of line one and Kentaro standing in front of line two, very much continuing this theme of dualities that this show is all about as evidenced by the symmetrical dualities in the intro animation of the show. Check out my breakdown of the first two episodes of Monarch where I go into this show's excellent use of cinematography to convey this theme of twos because it is honestly pretty damn incredible and the artistic side of my brain loves it so damn much. But anyways, when Tim's boss comes to address the Randa situation, we learn that Tim had no prior authorization from Monarch to go after Bill Randa's files. And it seems that Tim himself believes that Randa's research and discoveries could potentially help the world prepare for another Titan attack, despite Monarch dismissing Bill Randa's research as a bunch of nonsense. So Tim not informing his higher-ups that he was going after Bill Randa's research sort of implies that not even Tim trusts the higher-ups at Monarch with what is in those files. Like, it would be kind of crazy if it was revealed that Tim was the estranged biological son of Lee Shaw later on in the series because it would kind of make sense why Tim's partner Duval vouches for Tim by telling their boss that he's the most capable agent that they have to track down Shaw. But anyways, when we get a flashback to 1954 Bikini Adol, Keiko notes that she would rather lose funding than obliterate a living creature that they don't understand just because they're afraid of it, which is something that I found to be super interesting and ironic considering what we know about her husband's future in Kong Skull Island. Because John Goodman's 1970s Bill Renda had the complete opposite mentality when he gathered a bunch of military men to hunt and kill Kong on Skull Island. After losing so many men at sea to a monster as the sole survivor of the USS Lawton, it appears that Bill Randa losing Keiko as well could have pushed him over the edge and caused him to adopt General Pocket's hatred and intolerance towards Mudos. And later, when the gang are on their plane to Alaska, Shaw tells Kate that her father didn't lie to her about his monarch life, but was merely keeping a secret from her, echoing what Keiko tells Lee's younger self about keeping secrets for the greater good after Lee informs Keiko and Bill of the blank check that the American military wrote for them to continue their monster hunting research. And later, when Bill Randa asks why they just don't go public with what just went down during that classified nuclear test, young Lee Shaw references the electrocution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, a sentencing carried out by the U.S. government just a year prior in 1953 after the couple was convicted of sharing classified military and nuclear information to the Soviet Union. But anyways, as the plane ride continues in the modern day, May references Yeti sightings in Alaska, which could potentially be a bit of foreshadowing considering how we saw an image of what appeared to be Bigfoot in Bill Randa's files. So having a Yeti show up at some point in the series would be a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. And speaking of surprises, after Kate and Kentaro discuss discover signs that their father survived the destruction of his plane, their pilot quickly realizes that Hiroshi's plane was actually destroyed by a Mudo after a safe landing before promptly being killed by that very same creature that the pilot was trying to escape from, leaving the gang stranded in the mountains alone to face an angry spiky frost kaiju modeled after a star-nosed mole. If a star-nosed mole could suck you so hard that you turn into a popsicle, God do I regret saying that sentence. But no, I genuinely wonder what the hell is going to happen in this next episode because these people are screwed. I have no clue what's going to happen that's going to save them from this mess outside of Godzilla showing up out of nowhere. If there is actually a portal at this location, I hope they find it quick because uh, I do not see how they get out of this. But they obviously have to, so I cannot wait for episode four. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of Monarch Legacy of Monsters episode three. What did you guys think of this episode? And how are you guys feeling this series in general? Let us know in the comment section below 
below. You can follow me at Mastertainment on Instagram and Twitter or wherever I am on the internet if you guys want to see me post some weird shit. But most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube because we always got some fun stuff for you guys. And also, if you're feeling generous, feel free to hit that like button because every like always helps the channel. But again, thank you guys so, so, so much for watching this video. You guys are amazing, and I'll see you guys soon. Goodbye.